Good afternoon, Rebecca. How are you doing this Sunday? I am wonderful. Um, rainy Sunday in New York. That means I work all day. <laughs> yes, but those April showers bring May flowers, right? Or that's what they taught us in preschool. That's what they taught us. <laughs> <laughs> I was funny. I was looking up the weather in Italy before we spoke because I was in that mindset. I just watched your Instagram live where you're talking about Easter in Italy and it's raining there mm -hmm. too. So we might as well be... Um, in Europe. It's a shame. Oh, I know, I know. But you know, the whole world is adjusting right now. So, you know, I think we have a couple more months to try to get more people vaccinated and try to, you know, get a good understanding of how we have to take care of each other. Um, I think if we all just thought about not just taking care of ourselves, but talk, taking care of others, Yes, we could come out of this. Um, this has been quite an, a year and a half. And um, I think that we just need to, you know, be positive and be proactive and take care of each other. I, I think we're too selfish in our thinking as people all over the world. You know, we all want to run out and have fun and do things. But I think we really do have to be responsible for each other. Yeah, I find myself reflecting on that a lot lately as it feels like, like, oh, pinch ourselves. Like, is it true? Are we there? Is it over? But it's been such a humbling year and it's really shown how we need to take care of each other, like you said, and how we're we really so do. interconnected. Um, it's crazy. And I um, I want to be mindful myself going into next year. Like, how do we remember those lessons? Like, how do we not let but hopefully what good is to come, like erase what we learned in this time. And so. Oh, totally. Uh, <laughs> You know, I was thinking about the adjustment that everyone has to go go through to, you know, when we, as we slowly, slowly come back into a new normal, because it's not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it, and it affects the entire universe. I mean, we're all, all our lives have been uprooted and, and changed and all ages from little children who didn't have the chance to go to school, to college students, to people who graduated and wanted to find jobs and they don't have enough jobs out there. So I think that if anything, it would be so nice if we just came out a bit kinder to each other. Yes, I think, um, so people say maybe that art is one of the ways that we capture history. And I think what's really special about today, and I'm so excited to see how you have used, you know, your talents and your background to really capture that kindness, capture what it's meant to be going through this as a community. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Rebecca, for everyone who tunes in. This is Rebecca Moses. She is an artist and designer hailing from New York today. Um, and I can't wait to, to learn more about your story, Rebecca. I'm very <laughs> happy to share. So I'd love to begin at the beginning. I was reading um, one of your, your bios online. Maybe it, it sounds like you grew up in New Jersey. Is that right? Yes. I was born in Jersey City, which is literally across the river on the Hudson River from Manhattan mm -hmm. and grew up in most of my life in North Bergen. I went to FIT, which is the Fashion Institute of Technology, a wonderful university, part of the State University of New York. Um, but a wonderful school for design, um, whether it be fashion or textiles or photography or interior, they have so many incredible specialities. And I went there for two years because in those days, those days, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was the last class that could have, it was only a two year program. So, and I skipped a year in high school. So I was very, very young. Wow. Um, so I graduated FIT when I was 18 and um, I had a really incredible education, but so much more to learn because you can only learn so much in school and then you've got to really work hard and humbly to grow and really learn your craft and learn how the business operates also. So I got a job right out of school which was designing for Pierre Cardin um, Coats and Suits, which was a license, a US subsidiary of Pierre Cardin. And um, my first uh, assignment was to go to Paris to 
see the couture collection of Monsieur Cardin, who recently just passed away. And it was like a dream, you know, to go to Paris. It was my first trip to Paris and um, to experience couture, haute couture in Paris is quite a remarkable experience. Um, it's really, and, and in those days, it, we, we weren't so much about the celebrity, you know, cycle that we're in today. They were really in the couture, you had really princesses and queens and, no you know, millionaires. Cause in those days we didn't have the billionaires, we had the millionaires. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was so select the people that were sitting there. I mean, you'd have a movie star, but it was usually a French movie star. And, you know, it was just, it was just a different experience and seeing the couture, having the chance to meet Monsieur Cardin and spend a few minutes with him and talk about, you know, fashion. And it was a privilege. It was truly a privilege. And I learned a lot and, um, and I stayed doing that for about three years. And then I just decided like a crazy young person to start designing my own collection. Oh my goodness. And so before you even got to FIT, you know, did you always want to be a fashion designer? Were you? Yeah, I, I kind of decided that um, when I was about 14. Um, I, I had also loved dancing, and but I knew I wasn't really good enough to be a great a great dancer. Um, I think that, you know, you know, if, if that's what you really want, you know, and I didn't feel my body was prepared for that. I don't feel I had the, um, I, I didn't feel I had what it took to be the best as a dancer. And I loved fashion. I used to watch a lot of old films with my mom and sister and, you know, to see the great Adrian and Edith Head and all of these amazing designers who used to design for Hollywood. Um, it's, it was something that just inspired me. And um, I started sketching when I was around 14 and I would just sketch and sketch. And in those days, we used to get these catalogs and they were illustrated. So I taught myself how to sketch from those catalogs. And, um, and then I decided I really wanted to go and study. And so I, I skipped a year in high school, doubled up on all my majors. And, um, and initially I had applied to like three universities and I applied to RISD and Parsons in New York mm -hmm. and uh, FIT, and I got accepted to all three. And um, because of some personal problems, I decided I didn't want to leave New York. And, um, you know, I always say, you know, you never know why we decide where we, what we decide. And um, I see children and young people who are under so much pressure to decide where to go to school, what to do, do I go here, do I go there? And there's so much pressure on these students. I mean, it's really hard. And then the financial cost too is, is okay. immense. So, but I ended up deciding to stay in New York and I went to FIT, which was a state school. So financially the cost wasn't so crazy. And, you know, it was perfect for me. Um, but I believe, you know, you got to let destiny take its course. Yes. You know? But I, and I think, um, what's great in your education too, is like New York is an education in itself. Even if you grew up there, you know, um, yeah. when I was looking at my own colleges, my dad was like, if you want to do business, like, why would you leave the city? Like, there's so much to learn right here and right. so much right. to learn everywhere, but I'm sure like being around the fashion world of Manhattan was influential, mm -hmm. whether you would have been at FIT or Parsons or anything like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think I was so determined to become a fashion designer that you could have sent me to a business school and I would have still figured it out. <laughs> this is still going to be my fashion education. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. What I think was really interesting in your, your route too, is that you, you had the formal education. You mentioned how like, it still leaves you needing to know so much more about like the actual day-to-day -day of being a designer. Yes. And so you made the choice to go to an established 
organization yes. first before yes. embarking on your own. Can you speak a little bit about what you learned there versus what your education? Sure. Had? I mean, um, you know, I even worked since I was 14. I, I got all kinds of part-time jobs. I'm a worker. Um, and if you love to work, you'll find a job doing something. Yeah. And for me, I didn't care what I was doing as long as I had a job in the fashion world. And um, I always say to kids, you know, and I say kids, I mean, young people that, you know, be humble, know you have a ton to learn. You know, it's not just about sitting down and designing, I wish. You know, so much of the time is in so many other things. You have to learn research. You have to learn how to work with other people. You have to understand what makes a business happen, that you are not an island, that you don't rely just on yourself, that you have so many other elements and parts of what goes on that you have to learn, understand, and respect. Because without all these other things, you're just an island and you can't survive. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I had jobs in one part-time job. I used to take the bus into New York and hand paint t-shirts for a company. Um, then I, I got another part-time job in school doing what they called rub-offs. So this company made these evening gowns that were all embroidered, but then they would do the sample here in New York, and then they would send the dress to Asia to be copied. So um, I had to do the rub off. So I would take tissue paper over the beatings and rub it off with like a chalk. And that piece would then go to Asia with photographs. So that was a part-time job. And I used to like do it. Like I remember I was like in a closet basically working on it. You know, it was, it was just, I was so excited just to be working, you know, like to have a job and earn my own money and learn and, you know, be in fashion, you know. Uh, I, it was something for me that I dreamt of. And um, I don't know, it's just, I, I just think that you need a certain type of strength and determination to work hard. You, I, I don't know, I, I feel that a lot of people today want things to happen fast. Mm -hmm. Like you wanna become famous because fame is such a big um, uh, example of what is on social media. You know, the power of fame, you know, um, and, and, you know, I never forget, you know, the Andy Warhol quote, you know, famous for 15 minutes, you know. Yes. I just think that you don't do fashion just to become famous. You know, you do it because you love the art of creating and the art of dress and the art of the craft. And there's so many things that you can't learn in school. You can only learn so much in, in school, whether you go four years or six years. There's so much you can learn. Then you have to learn application and you have to learn, you know, how to source and how to produce and how to you know, understand the industry because it is a business. It's not, it's not just an art, you know, this is a commercial business design. So I think that it's, I, I, there's so much history to be learned. And, and, I, and I say that sometimes I'll speak to, you know, designers and I'll say, oh, do, this reminds me of Georgia and Angelo and they'll say, who's Giorgio San Angelo? And I will say, oh, he was an incredible designer um, like in the seventies and he used to do these really colorful clothes and, um, and um, you know, you should really read up on him or, and, and I know that they don't really know this person. Um, and there's so many, you know, and it's not to study them so you copy, it's to study to learn what history, you know, if you understand history, if you understand how fashion has evolved, 
you also understand how to move for the future because each aspect of fashion is a reflection of the times that we live. So we don't want to copy the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, but there may be influences that attract you and get into your head. But the more information you have and the more history you understand, the better a designer you will be and the more humble you'll be because everybody thinks, oh, no one's ever done this. And I was like, everything has been done, but it's how you do it. It's Uh, how you do it, you know. I think there's so many good like intersecting themes there, you know, with the analogy made to an island and how we really can't be that like, you can do your research so that you're not an island because you understand where your industry has come from and where it's going. You can go to an organization that exists to understand where it has come from and where you can go with that knowledge Um, and the humility of not seeking the fame. I have had the privilege of speaking with so many artistic people through this channel. And they really just, the, I think the general consensus is that they have to do art because they would not be, they would not be a kind person in their families. They would not be their fullest, brightest, most vibrant versions of themselves. It's so intrinsic to who they are. And it's not for the fame of it ever um, because the fame of it is such a tertiary um, it's true. I think that people, unfortunately, um, they they think too short term. And um, I think if you really learn your craft in a special way um, and you take time to learn it, you will be so much you'll have such more of a long term career. You know, I always say people, you know, don't rely on money from your family. Don't re- don't put your own money, learn and grow through other, other corporate structures, other companies, other experiences. And then when you really feel you're ready and, and you really think you have the experience to deal with, for example, banks, lawyers, um, you know, so many people want to be designers, but do you really know how to deal with unions? Do you know how to deal with you know, shipping abroad, do you know how trademark, do you know trademark law, intellectual properties, you know, exchange rates, are you going to rely just on an American business? Do you understand what shopping online means? Do you understand, you know, how do you protect yourself? How do you grow yourself? So there's, there's a lot to be learned. Yeah. Um, So along the lines of like, knowing the fundamentals in order to, you know, be creative with them and really put your stamp on them. um, One of the, the, things I read about you is that you were one of the first American designers to um, emerge in like the European market. And so was that what happened immediately after your work out of college? No, 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 no. (laughs) I was was a designer in New York from 1978 when I graduated FIT to about 1991. And in the years in New York, I I've had all the experiences you could imagine, you know, of, of starting your own business. So that's why I'm very protective for other people not starting too soon. You can get really burned and finding partners and you need partners. Sometimes you can't do everything yourself, finding honest partners, finding good partners, finding partners that have a compatible image, uh, vision of what you're thinking about and they're thinking about. So they're very hard things to find. So um, in 1991, I just, I had met a man and we fell in love and he could not leave to come to New York. And I decided, you know, just to go to Italy. And I, I really went in a very naive way in the sense that I did not know how I would make my living, how I would design there. Um, you know, fashion was not global yet. Um, And I think that for the most part, it was a leap of faith that I had. I had a leap of faith in my love for this man and I had a leap in faith that things would work out, that New York maybe wasn't the center of the universe, you know, it was that. And um, about a year after I got there, a friend of mine, a very dear friend, had come up to my house and seen the sketches because as always, even though I may, maybe wasn't working for about a year, um, I was sketching and thinking and trying to see my vision for the future and trying to figure out how I could get a job, how I could do certain things. And she introduced me to a woman named Donatella Gerambelli and um, 
she offered me a job to design for Jenny. And there was a big change in fashion because we were coming off the 80s, which was power dressing, very aggressive. And um, I was more of a minimalist at the time and more about un understated. Hold. Can you pause for a minute? Yes, no problem. Hold on, hold on one second. We're back. Okay. So I think that when she, you know, when I met this woman and I saw the brand and I, I was really kind of intimidated because this was Italian fashion house. It was a big house. And, and I, I knew my look was very different from what was that house. And um, I just decided that I felt I had to go with it. And this was the opportunity of a lifetime. And that the collection was designed by Johnny Versace for over 18 years, but he had also his own collection. So he, he, was, at a, he was like a big deal and big star and he had to concentrate more on his collection. And here I was this little American designer coming from New York working for a major house and you know I think it was looked upon from so many different ways I mean it, there were other Americans Tom Ford had been at Gucci he just got promoted to become the head creative director there um, Mark Jacobs had just come over to do a collection with Iceberg and you know there were there were a few of us from my generation from New York that had come over, but we, you know, a lot of Europeans said, who are these Americans? Like, what do they know about fashion? You know? <laughs> so, we all think um, we're the center of the universe, right? The Europeans think it, the New Yorkers think it, you just, you can't get away from it. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm made a little differently. I, I've always looked in awe to Europe, but I also respected my upbringing and my values and the way Americans approach design, maybe which was a little bit more analytical and a little bit more, uh, we ask certain questions like, who is this for? Like, who are we dressing? How does she live? You know, it was more about lifestyle. Um, the only thing that in Europe, you had this incredible ability to produce fabric materials. You had the workmen and the culture and that, that incredible structure to produce product that was on another level. So I really wanted to learn all of that. I wanted to understand what it was like to work in a couture salon, what, what in, in a, like a couture room where they made couture evening dresses or how to make the finest sweater that you could make. So I was open to learning and growing into this and using all this amazing access to talent that taught me so much. Yeah, I think what stands out to me also in, in your story is that, you know, your friend connected you to this person. So like your friend had to know who you were, what you were looking for in life and how you were hoping to grow. And I think part yes. of my understanding of, you know, what's important for us as um, like young people and emerging in of any profession is to have yes. a, enough of a sense of what you're stri like what you're hoping to do and how you're hoping to serve the world that other people can be advocating for you and creating yes. like, thinking of you when there is a, a time that that makes sense. Yeah, it's so true. And 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 it was in a, it was like a earthquake happening in Europe. I mean, it really was. I mean, the walls of of division were falling down. I mean, designers started crossing borders and companies started looking at designers from other countries and it wasn't so nationalized the fashion as it was earlier. I mean, French fashion started evolving. I mean, Italian fashion started changing. You know, things change as other visions cross borders and enter. And um, it was a very exciting time to be in Europe. Yes. Um, so you mentioned a couple of minutes ago that before that point, fashion wasn't globalized and that it was nationalized. Do you mean that Italians were wearing Italian designers or that? It no, I think that there were certain attitudes in each country that made it traditionally French. I mean, they, you still have certain characteristics, but it, like when I got to Italy, you know, and I remember bringing my sketches to show the owner of the company and she said, oh, Rebecca, they're beautiful, but we can't show black. 
because black is a, is a color of mourning in Italy. And I was like, really? I was like in shock because in, in America, black was the number one selling color. And how could you not wear black? And as I, I, as I watched the culture and I saw how so many um, women would wear a dark blue suit at dinner, you know, and, and it was, there was tradition. There was what time of day you wore things where I was like, like when, when she would say, what hour of the day would you wear that? And I would say, it depends what you do, you know? And, and I know it sounds so strange and foreign, but you know, there were not rules, but there were traditions mm -hmm. and people don't like their traditions to be changed so much. And um, so we had to evolve it very carefully because um, it was a big company. And so we showed black, we showed dark blue, we showed, and you know, the stores that had the risk in them and the, you know, they would say, no, I think I'm gonna buy some black. And then the next season black would go up more and more and more, you know, and it was a, it was a time of evolution, you know? I, I, I mean, fashion changes. I mean, you know, it's so funny if you, you look at a shoe that you bought maybe a few years ago that you thought was so fashion forward, um, maybe it was a big platform and now you look at that big platform and it really doesn't look that big it looked kind of like this and when when now you're up to here you know everything is is gradual yeah a gradual adjustment to the eye I love that the words careful and earthquake and evolution happen in the same conversation because I think yes you know on the surface level they're so contradictory but here they're so important to be looking at them in the same vein I mean Yes. Um, I love that you showed respect for the European like cultures that you interacted with and also saw the value in the way the U.S. was doing things differently. And so um, breaking down those barriers, I can imagine, took a lot of sensitivity to. Well, you know, I, I think it was my upbringing that, you know, if you don't know, ask, you know, if you if you make a mistake, admit it, you know. If you don't understand something, explain. I don't understand it. Can you explain it to me? Because, and then when you understand it, you know how to go forward. But if you want to be like too proud and too like, oh, of course I understand it. Well, not really. I don't understand it, and but I want to understand it. So if you tell me that you your customer is frightened or intimidated by black because it's too reminiscent of a painful time, then we have to figure out how to get there in a way that she understands it. And that comes from the support of the press. It comes in support of the retailers. It comes into support of dialogue. Women saying, you know, I feel kind of cool in black and why is black? just black doesn't have to be just for mourning black can be many things you know so I think it's that's why I say you know sometimes you have to to plunge but sometimes you have to think before you plunge you know <laughs> and there's some artfulness to knowing the difference um, I'm sure yeah. are there some favorite memories from that time in Italy or what was the and and like how did your journey evolve from there but it was really quite challenging because I didn't speak the language and the language is such a different language structure than the English language. I mean, you're, you're talking about a language that has formal and feminine and masculine and, and understanding that is to understand the culture because, you know, you don't say ciao to anybody. Ciao is an informal that you say to a close friend. If I meet you on the street, I don't say ciao. Salvo, right? I don't know yes. you. You say buongiorno, salvo, you know, whatever you feel comfortable, but you don't say ciao. I mean, that's like so breaking the rules, you know, or, you know, you you call a, a, a married woman signora, a single woman signorina, you know, I mean, it, it's like all these different things. And it was really fun foreign for me because like how do I know she's single how do I know she's not married just because she's 30 doesn't mean she's married you know and and I say how do you know she's not a signorina or how do you know she's not a senior <laughs> and people would look at me and I, would go, I I know this sounds strange but it's like we just say hello you know and and you know I, I, but if you understand that you understand that there is class structure you know that there is like like I would walk into a room and 
you know, say hi, everybody, you know, and everyone's like, oh, that's very friendly, you know. So, you know, I, I used to have to like kind of learn my place in a way, but not that I never wanted to not be me, but I felt that I had a lot to learn about the culture and how to behave and how to not fit in, but not to make people feel uncomfortable. Um, and eventually, I, I think because I've, I have such fond memories of the friends, both professionally and personally that I made. And I think I made it because I was very open, which was something they weren't used to. Um, they weren't used to people sharing things like I would share them. And um, I didn't play the diva or the prima donna, you know, like, oh yeah, I'm so-and-so, you know, it's like, hey, you know, like, I, and that's the way I am because I don't, I don't see, I, I just know what it takes to be in life. You know, you have to respect everyone. I mean, just because you think your job is more important and it isn't. You know, I always say to like interns when they would come into the company, I would say, um, that person who just brought a box into you, you say thank you to because if they didn't have it, you'd have to walk across the building, go down the staircase, get the box, sign for the thing. That's a very important person. These people are all important. Without one of these people, your life would change. So understand respect person who's kind enough to bring you a cup of coffee you say thank you to you know that these are things it's just manners and behavior that and and no matter how important you are I used when I would hire people and we were a small when I opened up my own company about uh four years after I got to Italy um I when I would hire people I say if I can serve coffee you can serve coffee if I can answer a phone you will answer a phone um this is like a small family here and we all have to know that the idea of success is on all our shoulders not just one so remember that and know that the customer is the queen you know it's not me i gotta serve the queen you know which is the customer I got to deliver good design, good quality, good product, good service, you know, do it all. And I have to take care of my staff. And I have to take care of the whole situation, you know? So it's a very, it's a mentality that if you don't have it, I don't see the longevity in someone's career if you don't operate like that, you know? No, it's such an- It goes around, comes around. You never know somebody you didn't think you had to be nice to or had to give proper respect to. All of a sudden, it's at the other side of the table one day, and you're saying, oh, shit, why didn't I, why didn't I, you know. Yes. Uh, to say, you know, you have to let people know when they've done something wrong or whatnot, but you need to work in a, in a well-mannered way. Yes, I am. Um, I think that that ideology and like that, just that mindset is so important. And if we remember just the ways that um, we've been privileged and that we've ended up in these circumstances that we could not have possibly predicted to some extent, yes. um, you know, yes. like that's a really helpful maybe for, for making sure we are equally kind and respectful. I agree. And I agree. <laughs> um, so you were overseeing this fashion house in Italy, but eventually you came to have your own label, right? You made um, like cash. So, yes. Yeah. So what happened was I was with Jenny for five years, about three years into my contract, I decided I wanted to start a small cashmere collection and it ended up being much larger than what I expected it to be. And I wanted to change the whole mood of cashmere. I wanted to get it into beautiful colors and fluorescent colors and pale colors and dusty colors. I wanted to really show it in a different side and make sexier clothes at it, more feminine clothes. And um, we opened the collection in 1997 and, um, and we sold all over the world. Um, and it was, it was a very exciting time. And um, a year after that, my first son was born, Max. Yeah. And then three years later, my second son was born, Benjamin. And, um, 
and then I was advising other companies and um, uh, I did a whole big lifestyle project for a company called Pinider, mm -hmm. which was really um, a stationary company that made handmade stationery, and I made that into a lifestyle brand. And, um, you know, in Italy, designers can consult and advise other companies. So I did that for a while. And then in 2009, my husband got very sick and um, he, he passed very quickly, uh, like in six months. And, um, and that was a big turning point in my life uh, for my children and for myself. And, um, about it two years before I closed my company. Um, and I decided I would bring the boys to New York with me for a while and see, I wanted to kind of get out of Italy for a little while because it was really too painful for me and for them. And I wanted them to have their studies and not be in this small environment um, kind of have a fresh start. And so I came back to New York with them. At the same time, I was working on a book that I had done with Monticelli Press, which was then owned by Random House, called A Life of Style. And that was published in 2010, literally the year my husband passed away. So um, it was a, a very big turning point. And I decided that uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do in New York um, because after you have your own company, your own brand, I mean, coming back to New York, it wasn't like, it's not like Europe. There's not all these companies that need, you know, advice and it, it, it's different the way it operates. And um, I decided that um, I, my, the editor in chief of Italian Vogue said, Rebecca, why don't you start doing some illustration stories with us? and put your focus on your art for a while, which gives you time to focus on the kids. She was a really great mentor, great friend, Franca Sitsani, and she gave great advice. And um, that's what I did. So when I came back to New York, the book had just launched. I was doing some, a little bit of advice for some companies here and um, doing a lot of storytelling, um, illustrating stories, um, just, kind of celebrating the art of illustration, then started painting. Um, and I had my first show in New York in 2012 at the Traffic Art Gallery. And then um, I started doing collabs with different companies like Mac Cosmetics, um, you know, was doing catalog work and illustration work for uh, Panerai, for, you know, the wonderful watch company. And I mean, I could just go on and on, you know, just interesting projects, kind of just trying to find my way. Um, and then I started doing more consulting work back in Italy, but staying here in New York. So it was very interesting. And I've had to date to um, since I've arrived about seven shows, uh, ex art exhibits um, here in New York, Florida, Miami, in, um, in, in Tokyo, in Milano, and New York, I had two major shows here. So, you know, it's, it's been an unplanned journey, which if anything, this last year was very unplanned. I think that the resilience shines through it though. And I think um, to the pivot to illustration was, is really cool. And it's, it's, it's coming about in so many beautiful and um, value adding ways for our, our planet. Um, you mentioned that the, your friend at, at Vogue had encouraged you to start illustrating, but um, as I understand it, you'd been illustrating all along. It just wasn't your all like, along. business making yeah. thing. It was, it was illustrating for my, with my voice, like in the old days, like, in the 90s we used to we, we not everything was on on the telephone 
So we would do like these fun invitations and I would do sets and create my show with a set behind it and I would paint the set. And, you know, it was all about telling a story. And, uh, but the story was really about the Rebecca Moses world in pertaining to what I was designing. So when I, when I left and I didn't have, let's say the Rebecca Moses brand that I was illustrating, it started to evolve into more of my vision of women. And I felt that women really needed to be celebrated more, um, that they needed to be proud of their uniqueness, about their individuality, about the way they looked, the way they acted, who they were, and not to be embarrassed for their oddities or uniqueness, but to embrace them. Mm. So that became the underlying message in my paintings which was to say to women, own it, own who you are. Don't, don't even, and by owning it, you got to celebrate it. You've got to really like, if you have an eye that dips down when you talk, own it. You know, if you have a nose with a hook on it, maybe you should cut your hair short, and really make it, you know? Yes. So it was like me saying, you know, okay, like, as, as people start blending together and people don't know like what people are, like it has to be pickled and packaged, you know, and you have to give like a DNA receipt when people say, what are you? It's like, how can you even ask a time, like a question like that, you know? So I love celebrating people that say, I am who I am and I'm going to celebrate it. So the women that I paint, um, in the beginning, it was mostly out of my subconsciousness, the, the women that I painted. It wasn't so much women that were real women. They came from bits and pieces of my memory since I've worked with so many remarkable women through my career. I mean, you know, I mean, I think when Naomi did, Naomi Campbell did her first show for me, she was 15, you know what I'm saying? It was like, you know, all these women that became supermodels, we kind of, grew up in the, the the business together I mean maybe I was you know five years six years older but you know I saw these girls when they were starting you know and and so it's very interesting watching you know as my art developed I was allowing myself to grow and to express and to try to also figure out what was the purpose of my art um, because I've always created with a purpose um, and I had to really evolve and learn what that purpose was. Um, so. <laughs> it is such a, a, a process and I'm really excited to talk about, you know, the stay home sisters and where that's evolved to, but I want to take a second and ask a little bit about the inspiration for the way that you illustrate. Um, you referenced Diana Vreeland from Harper's Bazaar. And I, I wondered if you could speak to that connection. Sure, sure. Well, you know, Diane Freeland was a legend. She was a fashion editor who had such vision and such flamboyance and guts, you know. Mm -hmm. And she used to write a column called Why Not? You know, why not use the... Um, the ice bucket as a hat or why not use, you know, why not put on, don't walk out without your lips on or don't walk out without your fingernails on it. You know, she would, she would push the limit, you know, why not paint those walls red? You know, why not, you know? And um, when um, I did an interview, someone said, it reminds me of when Diane Vreeland would push the envelope and say, why not? you know and so my first show when I started was called um creatures of the fashionable kind and um and it was 
they were women that were almost mythological as, as I expressed them, you know, they were larger than life, but I wanted to make the point that sometimes you do have to be larger than life. Sometimes you do have to celebrate the uniqueness of being, you know, celebrate can be a lot of different things. You can celebrate through dressing, you can celebrate through entertaining, you can celebrate by how you serve tea. You know, you can celebrate life in so many different ways. Um, and, and that's how that all came about. There's a, you made me just think of, um, there's a great like documentary on the Carlisle um, Hotel, I think it is. And they talk yes. about like the dignity in just like every step of honoring a guest who goes there. So from the things yeah. of like their name being embroidered in the pillowcase to, you know, yeah. um, just yeah. the step-to-step -step attention to detail. And I think um, you can extend that dignity in your own life. For instance, I live in Bentonville, Arkansas, right? But there's a little hotel on our square that's beautiful and it's so artful and you know when things were in person and there was no COVID I could wake up at seven instead of eight and I could go have a cup of coffee in the hotel lobby and feel like I yeah. was a worldly you know uh, business yeah. owner and set myself up for a day where I treated myself like I could make a difference like I could work with people Absolutely. and understand the world and I think and you do make a difference yes Thank you. So, um, so I love that tie in to, and I thank mm -hmm. you for ex explaining that background. And now I would love to pivot to the purpose you found during COVID sure. with these stay home sisters. So I looked and it's a 360 girls um, and women in 21 countries, at least at this point, maybe even more. Oh, okay. So we're now at 410. Overnight. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy. So what happened was, um, as our world was slowly turning upside down, you know, and we were hearing from Europe, all these people were getting sick and don't forget, I have my family in Italy and they were telling me these stories and I was like, oh my God, you know, and, and I remember my sister calling me and saying, what are you doing? Are, should we buy groceries? What should we do? And I said, yeah, I think we should buy groceries. I think we should, you know, stock up on this. So it's like, you know, we were trying to all figure out how to, and, I was quite frightened. I will, will admit all my projects were falling off the shelves, you know, no, they, actually they weren't falling off the shelf. They were being put on the shelf. Um, they were just like, oh, I guess that book idea is off. And, you know, it's just everything was turning upside down. And, and it's quite frightening because, you know, I, I, I have my family to take care of and I have uh, a lot of things. I thought, what am I going to do? And anyway, um, I was illustrating every night as I was watching because we were glued to the television mm -hmm. um, and I was just illustrating like these women like fighting for groceries or you know learning how to do a zoom and they were very comical sketches because I always when I'm frightened like to make humor because I find that it breaks the anxiety a bit like if you can make fun of what you're going through you'll get through it because you have to, you know, it's, if you, if you allow it to eat you up, then you'll get really sick, you know? So, um, so true. So I, um, but I was doing it, but I wasn't getting a satisfaction and I was hearing the noise of the ambulances and the sirens and I was like I want to do something I want to help people what can I do and we were all being said you have to stay home and I was like you know I want to do something what can I do so one night I I came up with this idea of going on IG Instagram and telling girls like hey wherever you are you're not alone and why don't we connect you send me what you're going through in a, in a brief letter. And whether it's funny, whether it's sad, whether it's frightening, whatever, it, whatever you care to share with me and I'll do a portrait of you and we'll post what we're all going through. So, and letters just started coming in, you know, and as they started coming in, I was like posting them. And then the girls were like, this is, oh my God, that's me. And it's like, 
you know, yeah, I hope you like it. Oh, I love it. And, and then she would reach out to the next person who came on, you know, that would send me a letter. And then those two would reach out to the next two who came on. And so the stay home girls in a short time became the stay home sisters because these women were all connecting. Yes. And it became like this little tribe of women from all over the world that had the need to connect, um, whether they were alone or not. They, they had the need to connect with someone they didn't know. Because connecting with someone you didn't know didn't have the baggage. You didn't have to explain everything. And it was quite fascinating because you realize that this is such a unique thing that's going on. This is affecting the whole world. And all of these women from all over the world are all going through such similar things. And, um, you know, I had women that had just come through chemotherapy and they're going into a, a lockdown, but they were already locked down for four months because they had a low immunity. Mm -hmm. I had women who, you know, their kids were sent home from school, whether it was in Italy or not, you know, or in, in Paris or in, in New Zealand or Australia or California, they didn't know what to do with the kids. And, 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 and mind you, a lot of these women, they, they, they have children that have special needs. They were autistic children that had special teachers and all those people were disappearing out. They couldn't, so these poor women had to figure out how to adjust to either having lost their jobs mm -hmm. or working from home, having to teach their children. I'm not saying that all of these women were alone. Some of them had husbands, some of them had in-laws, parents, whatever. But whatever it was, whatever the scenario was, it was hell. And there was fear. It was fear because nobody knew, was this going to be like two or three weeks? Would this be on for a month? And we didn't have good leadership. We had horrible leadership. We had horrible leadership who was first trying to ignore it, then coming back into it, then saying, don't worry, you don't have to wear a mask. And then wearing a mask, don't wear a mask. Then we don't go out. You know, you have to go out. You know I mean? every day and then the politics got into it and it got uglier mm -hmm. and life became so we say in italian pesante it got so heavy it was heavy and intimidating and frightening and people needed distractions and i think connecting all these girls together we all started connecting with each other i was painting like a maniac maniac I've done in 2020, probably at least 400 renderings. Amazing. And I was, I, I said 2020 was the year I discovered a nap because I couldn't sleep because I felt like every time I was doing one, the woman would write and say, you gave me hope you gave me, you made me feel good. And I said, oh my God, I've got to paint faster. I've got so many more letters. So I would just keep painting more and more and more. And um, so what, what I would do is I would just be painting, then I'd go lie down for like an hour or so, and then get back up and go back painting for a few hours. Then I'd go back and take a little nap and come back. Up. So I was like, kind of, it was just bionic. And I, the adrenaline that I got from it, that I saw that maybe I was actually doing something good to help these women. And it was making, it gave me purpose. You know, it gave me a sense of purpose. That's as simple as it can be. Yes, I read the article in the New York Times about the portraits you did specifically for the nurses at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And I could feel yes. the sense of um, responsibility in it too, to honor the woman in ways that were, uplifting for them and you know you mentioned how past portraits that you did were not of like real people necessarily um yes. so did that did that weigh on you at all like how did you oh yeah I mean, that? It all weighed on me. first of all I wasn't sure if I could do it 
I mean, because most of my women came from my imagination Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, well, what if I paint this woman? And she goes, I don't look like that, or I don't (laughs) like that. But I always say to people that when an artist paints you, it's their vision of you. It's how I see you. Now, maybe I'll look at you and I see your hair and I see your headband and I see your brow shape. And maybe that's what I'm gonna focus on. It's what we see in each other that we wanna capture. And I think that there was something, I would like look at their Instagram page and read their letter and try to understand who this person was. And sometimes I would take it from an image from an Instagram photo. uh, And they said, I can't believe you worked from that photo because it's one of my favorite pictures. And I was like, hey, you have, we're on the same page, you know? And and, um, the nurses came about in a different way. one day I got a letter from, not a letter, I got a, yeah, I got a, a message on Instagram from a lady who said she wanted to honor her sister, but that she wasn't a stay home. She was a uh, nurse. And I said, great, she'll be a hero. And then I got another letter once from a woman from Bergamo, Italy. And she said, I'm not a stay home girl, but I'd love to be one. I work in a grocery store and my husband is a medic who works in an ambulance and Bergamo was so badly hit in Italy. It was one of the most worst regions. So it was quite amazing. And I said, no problem, you're a frontliner, you you have the rights, you know? And then afterwards, so the first picture, the first painting I posted was in March 31st, 2020. By May, I decided that I wanted to bring these women on Instagram Live to give them a platform because there were a lot of interesting things going on. Some of these women lost their jobs or they had to figure out ways to, like one woman, she had a bed and breakfast and she had no clients and she had to figure out how do we make money. So she started making, you know, embroideries and things like this. I mean, all these women had stories of survival and I thought, let's bring them on and give them time to share who they are. These are real people, whether they're CEOs, whether they're a cop, whether they're a nurse, whether they're a dentist, and we've got such diversity in profession, you know, whether it's a student in college who's really lost because she's not able to dance or whether she's a five-year-old girl who really misses her friends and she hates the big germ. I mean, I got letters from everybody. And I mean, these women truly, truly um, had to figure out how to pivot. And I thought, what better thing we could do would be to put it out on Instagram and these women could then have a voice because I feel that so much attention goes to celebrities and people that are famous, Mm -hmm. but there's so many remarkable people out there that are not famous, that are not rich, that are not, but they're doing fabulous things. And I think we have to truly give them a platform to be able to speak and share because they could inspire others who don't think they could do what they did. So, you know, we have fashion designers who are making candles now. We have, you know, um, I, I mean, it's just so many things. I, it's just so, it is. and I so, no, so just to, to let you know how the nurses came about was that one of the first women I had on was one of the, the, the girl that the sister wrote about who was the nurse. And she came on and shared her story. And then she asked me afterwards, would you do something to help me celebrate the nurses? 
And I said, absolutely. What do you want? 50, 50 illustrations? You got it. Um, and that's how that then. What I love in the, the nurse's example and also in the portraits that are on your Instagram is that um, you asked for photos of the woman that were of, in normal dress, right? Not in the yeah. hospital, covered yeah. in the PPE. Like you said, it was a hard time. Like it was, we needed distraction. We needed outlet and we needed hope. And so while their Instagram lives, not the nurse, you know, the people on your Instagram, um, yes. they're telling their true story and their true struggle. The ultimate outcome was a portrait of hope, of encouragement. And I think yes. that is so fundamental to what you did and such an important decision that you made. Um, in social work, we learned about craftivism and activism and activism can take a really strong, aggressive voice of like, we need to be community and you guys are not doing yeah. that. Or it can take a craftivist would maybe meet with a knitting circle and make pillows yes. of like, we can all be friends. And, and this takes that more like loving embrace approach that makes an impact that hits as hard, if not deeper and hopefully for even a longer term. Um, yes. because it gets at the well, you know, these nurses were, were really buried under protective clothing. I mean, when Linda Valentino came on the show and shared that she lost like 26 people in one day and she had to hold their hand and let them go. I mean, when you hear that story, I mean, that's something that just ripped my heart out. And so when I, was painting the nurses, I felt that they had to be seen. Mm -hmm. That's why I said, send me pictures of you in your favorite clothes, you know? And I wanted to capture that. I wanted to show them as real women, you know, real people, real women. Um, and they're so beautiful, each and every one of them. Each and every one of them has their own look, their own style. And um, it, it, was, it was a privilege to paint each one of them. I know it made such a difference in their lives too. There was quotes of them saying, you know, that someone wanted to paint me and that made me feel so good. And just to be acknowledged when you're doing like these just unforeseeably challenging, um, heartbreaking yes. work that not, we're not all equipped to do is amazing. Well, you know, it's really funny, um, Kara, that I never realized the power of portraiture and what it can do for another person. Um, you know, we, we live in a selfie world where everybody's taking pictures of themselves. And, but for someone to study another person, to really look at them, that gives you like, oh my God, they really studied me. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of it in this terms. That's why I say I never realized the power in my paintbrush that I could make someone feel better than they were feeling. And, um, and that to me is really makes me proud. Um, it made me grow as an artist. It made me grow as a human being. It made me realize that art could, could bring people together. It could bring pride to people. It could make dialogue, you know. We've come through such a bitter, angry, hate-filled year, actually more than a year. Um, and I think that the politics that we've witnessed in the last several years has put so much oil on intolerance and and that's heartbreaking to me. As a society, we have to move forward. We can't move backwards. Um, we can't feel threatened because someone looks different than we do. Um, we can't, we really have to start to understand each other and our, that we have a lot more in common than what, what, what divides and separates us. And doing this, I realized that wow, if I could do that with my little old paintbrush, what could we all do? It's not just on, I mean, it, it's not just on teachers and politicians to try to make the world better. We each have a responsibility to pick up that torch 
and trying to understand who lives next door to us, who delivers our groceries, what they go through, who, I mean, we do have to be more empathetic. And, and this year was a very powerful year, very powerful. It, it, I mean, yes, I <laughs> can without even words. It, it's been so um, life changing. How do you think um, this year and the way your work has has slightly maybe pivoted focus in this time will um, be like part of your future? Like, will this be the way your your work looks in the mm-hmm. next five yeah, years? Like, are you beginning to think about what hopefully post COVID um, Rebecca Moses is focusing? Oh God, <laughs> every day I'm thinking. Uh, every day's a new day. And I think the thing in life is to, to always keep pushing yourself forward, not to go back, but to go forward. So there's a lot of things that I'd like to do. Um, and it's much more humanity driven. So if my art can be humanity driven, if whatever form of expression, whether it's through storytelling, whether it's through media, whether it's through canvas, I have to figure a way to be part of that change because I don't want to see this much hatred in the world. I just, it rips my heart apart. And I'm gonna cry if I I talk about this. (laughs) But um, I don't know, we just have to change this world. We have to make it a better world, a more kinder world. And um, so whatever I do with my work, it's always going to be focused on that. And um, that's what's on the schedule. (laughs) Beautiful schedule to have. Um, And what would your advice be? So you know, people are sitting in their homes and their walks of life. Maybe they're designers, maybe they're artists, maybe they're not. What's your advice to them for making that first step to make the world a kinder, better place in whatever they're doing? I think that, you know, it doesn't have to be so premeditated, but it should, if you don't think about it, then you have to train yourself to think about it. Mm -hmm. It's like being in business. You can't just be in business just to make money. You have to think of, I don't think companies who are only thinking about a profit will succeed any longer. They have to think about the ramifications of what they do in their business. Um, Are they thinking about what they produce and how it affects the world? in its product meaning, but also in its, the actual effects on the environment. You have to think about it. Our world is changing. You know, it's, it's, we're being affected by, I mean, we have so many people that are, so many stay home sisters who are, that have businesses that are all based on sustainability. Um, One woman from Italy, she makes, she takes all the products that come out of the kitchen that like have like the like downy and the the cleaning products and she turns them into jewelry and and objects. She's remarkable. And, you know, I know so many people, young people who are starting businesses thinking like that. So I think that the younger generation is thinking much more like that. I find that they're much more aware of our environment and the planet. And this is not just you know, pushing words around. Um, I think that knowing that you have a diversified group of people working for you, this is very important. And it's important because how can you be a successful brand or business or service if you don't understand diversified people? So I think that besides being having a moral compass, I think it's also about knowing what makes success is understanding the diversity and the diversity in cultures and needs 
and that will make you more successful. So I think that we do have to be more premeditated in what we do and how it affects people. And it's my hope, you know, I, I, I've seen so much in my life already. I've had a very full life and I have pivoted many times in my life, some out of need, some out of choice, some out of just the way that things evolve. Um, I don't look back on my life when I had challenges and say, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. I understand it happened for a reason. And, you know, I'm a big believe, I'm a very spiritual person who believes in destiny and fate. And I, when, when things don't work out the way you plan, sometimes you almost have to say, okay, there's a reason this isn't happening. Maybe it's a good reason. It doesn't have to be a bad reason. You know, I remember when I was doing my book and we would shop it around to people and some people say, I don't get it. I think it should be like this. Or I think it should be like that. And, you know, that's one opinion. And um, especially the first time you do something and you go to someone who's done it their whole life and they're much more jaded and they may not have the vision that you have. So I think that sometimes things don't work out, but you should learn to let it flow sometimes. My sister always says to me, be careful what you wish for because you may get it and it may not be the best thing for you. And I think when I, learn to live and accept that I've learned to say maybe it wasn't the right moment maybe what I wanted then wasn't the right time but maybe it will be maybe it won't be but let me keep moving forward if you just keep moving forward and you keep your eye on the things that are important and live pretty a, a good clean life when I say that meaning be respectful and be humble that to me is a good life you know you, you and, and admit when you need help, admit when you don't understand something. And, and if that's not directed to people in their 20s or 30s, I'm talking to people in their 50s, 60s and 70s. I mean, we're all learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no cutoff time like, oh, you're gonna learn until your 30s and then that's it. I mean, forget about it, you know? I mean, there's so many incredible things you can do at your life at any age. I, I don't like to gear my dialogue to just young people. I think that there's so many people that have had dreams to do something and maybe this last year made them realize that, what am I waiting for? I've got to do it. So I think that's kind of wonderful if that happened during this past year. A lot, there were a lot of silver linings in this past year, a lot. For sure. I so appreciate your sharing your, your wisdom and taking this time and all of your, um, you know, gained insights from your experiences, from the ways you've leaned into opportunities and just the ways the world was moving around you. And um, I want to just close on asking you, Rebecca, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and about your work? And when they think of, you know, Rebecca Moses <laughs> and these stay home girls, what should be popping into their, into their mind? I'm a work in progress, you know, I, I'm definitely a work in progress. And I, I hope whatever I put out there is good and positive. And, you know, I just want to keep growing every day. And I hope people will appreciate the things I bring out through my work. And if it can make a little bit of a difference in your life, it can bring you a little joy. If looking at one of my paintings can make you feel something that's positive and, and then I'm glad. Uh, I, like I said, I'm a work in progress. And we all are, and we all should always be, I think. Um, so yeah. I, I love to be closing on that note, Rebecca, thank you so much for being so kind to take the time it's, to with me. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Kara.